Thank you everyone so much and welcome to our second panel for Revival Lost Southern Voices, Rediscovering Frank Yerby. A few housekeeping notes before we begin the presentation this afternoon. If you would like to ask a question during this conversation, please do so by using the Q&A feature. You'll find the Q&A button at the top or the bottom of your screen, depending on your device. Please click that and then type in your question so we can answer them in turn. Also, we've enabled live transcription for our hearing impaired patrons this afternoon. If you'd like, locate the CC button at the top or bottom of your device, click on it, and then you can resize the font to make it easier for you to read. I'd also like to point out that we do have book links to local booksellers who are providing books for this particular event. Today is Eagle Eye Bookshop, and you'll find those links over in the chat section. I'd also like to note that if you missed today's panel or any of the panels and you'd like to review them, that we will post them to the Georgia Center for the Book YouTube channel in the coming weeks. In regard to the raffle, please remember that we need to see your first and last name either in the chat or registered in the chat box above, just so we can make sure we get the books to the right person. You will receive an email from us in the following days to let you know how you can pick up your books from the Georgia Center for the Book. Right now, I would like to introduce Eli Arnold and then turn it over to our program. Eli Arnold currently serves as the Director and University Librarian at the Philip Weltner Library at Oglethorpe University. He served as the Treasurer of the Georgia Library Association and currently serves as the Editorial Staff of the peer-reviewed Georgia Library Quarterly. When not assisting students at Oglethorpe University and their faculty members, Eli enjoys researching his alma mater, LGBTQ history, and the American poetry scene between World War I and World War II. So please join me to welcome Eli and the rest of the panelists. Eli? Thank you. Uh, today, I'd like to first start by introducing our panelists, our Yerby scholars. Um, first, I'd like to introduce Dr. Veronica Watson. Uh, Dr. Watson is professor in the Department of English and Director of Graduate Studies in Literature and Criticism and convener of the Frederick Douglass Institute Collaborative of Pennsylvania State System of Higher Education. After completing graduate work at the University of California, Berkeley, Dr. Watson earned her PhD in English from Rice University. She teaches, publishes, and presents on a range of topics, including Black detective and crime fiction, Southern American literature, civil rights literature, critical race theory, and critical whiteness studies. She's the editor of the short stories of Frank Yerby, the author of The Souls of White Folks, African American Writers Theorize Whiteness, and the co-editor of Unveiling Whiteness in the 21st Century, Global Manifestations, Transdisciplinary Intervention. She's currently director, currently directing a public humanities project that utilizes black detective fiction as a Jedi training platform for law enforcement. Our second panelist is Dr. Valerie Matthews. Dr. Matthews is a professor of English at Georgia State University Perimeter College. She holds a BA in English from Tougaloo College and an MA and PhD in English with a major in African American literature from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She is the recipient of an NISOD Teaching Excellence Award and UNCF Mellon Fellowship, and she's passionate in creative composition and American literature professor with over two decades of service at Georgia Perimeter College. She routinely combines her musical talents and literary training to enhance her classes and perform at community events and conferences regarding the nexus between African American literature and music. Her administrative experience includes assist assistant chair roles and a one-year interim appointment as director of the Perimeter Leadership Academy, an initiative for the retention of African-American men in the University System of Georgia. She's currently serving as the assistant chair of English at Perimeter's Clarkston campus. Dr. Matthews wrote her doctoral dissertation on Frank Yerby's novel, wrote a chapter in novels for students on Yerby and regularly presents on Yerby at conferences. Our final panelist is Dr. Matthew Tetch. Dr. Touch is director of the Lillian E. Smith Center at Piedmont University. He earned his PhD in English at the University of Louisville Lafayette and maintains <laughs> Interminable Ramblings, a blog about literature, composition, culture, and pedagogy. He has published articles and book reviews in various journals, and his research focuses on African-American, Southern, and 19th century literature. He's also the editor of Rediscovering Frank Yerby, Critical Essays, 
and his current project examines Christopher Priest's run on Black Panther. So I'd like to start with asking uh, Dr. Watson uh, to tell us a little bit about Frank Yerby. Hello, everyone. Um, it is such a wonderful uh, opportunity to be with you and thank you very much. I wish I were there in Georgia, but I am in Pennsylvania. So uh, it is wonderful to be with you virtually in this particular case. So I've been tasked with sharing a little bit about um, our esteemed scholar um, or esteemed writer this afternoon, Frank Yerby. So I am just going to go ahead and hit my, here we go. Okay. So um, I titled this little short presentation about Yerby, which is basically going to give you some biographical information, a little bit of background information about him, and of course, give you a, a bit of more information about him as a writer. And um, I frame this as a man in shadow, which is really one of the things that we're going to be talking about uh, together this afternoon. So a man in shadow, because um, information, knowledge about him is fairly limited. And what we do know has been recirculated. Uh, and so there's now an opportunity for us to get a lot more information, a lot more current information than perhaps we've ever had. But up until quite recently, we had a fairly singular narrative about Frank Yerby, and we didn't have a lot of detail to it. So who was Frank Yerby? Well, he was born in Augusta, Georgia. So he's a Georgia guy uh, in 1916, um, graduated from Payne College in 37. He earned his MA from Fisk University in 1938 and even started to pursue a PhD from the University of Chicago. But he abandoned that uh, because he started a family and things got busy. So he worked at a car assembly plant in Detroit. He was a WPA writer um, in Chicago. So he did a lot of different things, um, ultimately leaving the United States, um, becoming an expatriate and moving to Spain in 1955. Um, he died, uh, as I say here on the slide, in Madrid, Spain in 1991, where he had spent most of his life as a writer. In Madrid, um, Frank lived a, a pretty uh, elite life. Um, he did well as a writer, and I had the great fortune of traveling there to uh, study him and, and to learn more about how he lived and where he lived when he was in Madrid. And I just include these three buildings because these are three of the most exclusive neighborhoods in Madrid. Uh, even today, they still are pretty exclusive. And you, at the time these buildings, um, at the time that Frank was living in these buildings, they were all very new, they were all very exclusive. Um, and the one that's in the center is still a centerpiece in Madrid. Um, it was pretty imposing and impressive at the time that it was built. You could imagine all the brownish areas sort of gleaming and copperish color. Um, it, was, it was really quite a sight to behold. So this gives you a sense that he did well as a writer and had achieved the goal that he had set for himself of being able to live and support himself and his family as a writer. He is a very prolific writer. Um, he authored 33 novels. Unfortunately, most of them, if not all of them, are now out of print. So you can only find them uh, on the used book market. So if you're ever wandering around and see an old bookstore and go in, check out and see if they have any Frank Yerby there. Uh, chances are they will, because uh, not only was he prolific, but he was a very well-respected and widely read author. And so there are a lot of his books still in circulation, even though they're not newly uh, being imprinted. When I was um, studying and learning more about Frank, um, I traveled to two archives uh, where some of his work is held. One of them is at Boston University, the other is at Payne College. And I learned that um, our picture of Frank is actually fairly limited. So published 33 novels, three of those were adapted into film. And um, while I was there at the archive, I realized that he was doing a lot more than just writing novels. And you got to wonder with 33 novels under his belt in his career, when did he find time to do anything else? But he had also written pitches for two television series. There were two unpublished novels that he completed. Um, 
one of which we think is no longer extant, no longer uh, with us. He may have burned it uh, because it didn't receive a home, but uh, another unpublished novel is there um, in the archive. Um, there are 25 short stories in the archive, and I only have published 11 of the uh, unpublished um, stories in my collection. Um, there are also poems. He was a, a he started as a poet, and actually, it seems had every intent on uh, pursuing his career as a poet, uh, but decided he couldn't make a living at it, and so he turned his attention to novels. And yes, he is the uh, one of the co creators of the Payne School song, which is still the Payne College song. Um, he was also a very talented writer. So uh, what you have here um, are a couple of firsts by him. So his first novel, very first novel that was published, The Foxes of Harrow, um, was the first novel by an African-American man to sell more than a million copies, following only the um, very first African-American novel uh, to sell more than a million copies across the board. That was written by Anne Petrie in 1940. So Frank was the second and the first African-American man. Um, he was also the first African-American uh, to have his novel or a novel optioned by a major Hollywood studio. And it was made into a film, The Foxes of Harrow, um, that was actually fairly well received at the time that it was published or sorry, released. So his recipes for success, um, how do you get to be that prolific? Well, <laughs> Frank sort of said, well, I come up with uh, a recipe. He came up with what he thought was a winning mix. And I think um, his mission and vision statements here, as I am calling them, give you a sense of really what he tried to accomplish in a great bit of his uh, writing. Although I think it's also a rather incomplete picture. But he did believe that the novelist's job was to entertain, at least for a part of his career, he believed that. And um, most of his writing, uh, a good bit of his writing, really focused on white characters, what we call white life novels. Um, he called them costume novels. So this uh, kind of marriage of entertaining and uh, wide mass appeal, he thought was the winning combination. Um, and I think he recognized that um, his readership, which was largely white and apparently didn't know that he was a person of color, um, was, was very wide. And as you can see here, he thought, um, you know, I'm reaching the folks that others aren't reaching, other people of color are not reaching. So um, he didn't have a problem with that as long as his work sold because he was supporting himself as a writer. So when I was at the archives, um, I quickly came to realize that what I understood about Frank was fairly limited. Um, so I showed you earlier that he was writing in a variety of genres, poetry, songs, pitching, uh, getting ready to or preparing to pitch a television series. Uh, he was writing all of these novels. Um, and it was at the archives that I found the short stories. And I only knew of one short story that he had published. And so it was really quite surprising to me that to find that there were so many there at the archive. Um, when I talked about his novels, I mentioned that he's really probably best well known, if not most respected, I wouldn't say that at all, but best well known for writing novels that were primarily about white characters. In fact, he was sort of charged with uh, abandoning the uh, social work of using literature to bring about social change. Um, and so when I get to the archives and I'm looking at all these stories, I was really struck by how many of them focused on um, the African-American struggle and what we might recognize as protest literature. So a fairly incomplete picture if you're only looking at the novels, and we know that there are two novels that uh, do in fact focus on uh, African-American characters. But when I looked at the short stories, um, you can see there's a much wider, much broader kind of range of, of short stories that take up the issues um, that most Black writers were being celebrated for. Um, the short stories seem to have come early in his career, um, <laughs> early in that they, in some of them, some of them seem to have been written uh, before he even published his first novel. But some of the others seem to have been uh, at least 
it looks like they were planned to be a collection of some sort that never got published for some reason. And we don't have all the answers to that. That so far has not been discovered. Frank was, um, as I was saying earlier, when he started his career, he was really focused on uh, making a living and um, writing novels that would sell and sell briskly and sell widely. Uh, but by the time you start looking at the letters that are in the um, archive, you see a shift that happens. Um, and toward the end of his career, he was much more interested in writing the next great American novel. Um, and you see him becoming much more um, willing to stand and fight for his vision of novels, uh, of his work and really pushing back against uh, a publishing industry that wanted to pigeonhole him into one kind of writing and to really um, sell his work and try to appeal to the same readers each time. Um, so I include this quote just to give a sense that um, I think the image that we have of him as someone who perhaps wasn't as serious uh, about um, the issues that faced uh, Black Americans in particular, but people who are marginalized and oppressed in all kinds of different ways. Um, but also the idea that being a popular writer uh, meant that he wasn't taken seriously critically uh, and by scholars, I think um, is doing him a real disservice. And so I just wanted to kind of include this as a last moment um, to, to remind us that um, people are multiple people change over time and where they start we don't always end and that's part of life and so i think that he was a much more complex thinker and uh, artist than we've given him credit for and i'm absolutely thrilled that we're here today talking about him and i have the opportunity to engage my colleagues in some conversation so thank you that's a little bit about frank thank you dr watson and if you wouldn't mind kicking us off uh, letting uh, the group know how were you introduced to uh yerby yes so i started with yerby because people know that at the end of a rough semester um, all the grading all the papers you know, all the student contact at the end of a semester i love to just settle in with a good book that i'm not thinking about doing anything with it's just there for fun and pleasure and relaxation and someone recommended the foxes of harrow in that vein to me and uh, i didn't know anything about frank yerby i couldn't have told you he was a writer uh, who was a person of color it was just a fun book and that's what i was looking for and when i started reading i was like wait a minute <laughs> who is this year be guy this is not what i thought was going to be a sort of rollicking fun jaunt here um, and so i started doing a little research so he actually became the genesis of my first book the souls of white folk because i was reading this and then i got interested because the book was way more interesting to me than I thought it would be. And so I went and did a little research of, just to find out who is Frank Yerby? Did he write some more stuff? And you know that started the journey. So that's how I found him. Someone said, you got to read this. This will be fun for you. <laughs> and it was. It was fun. Great. That's perfect. Dr. Matthews, how did you uh, uh, come up on Yerby? Well, actually, um, my mother was a former English and social studies teacher. And so she loved historical fiction, a perfect mix for her. And so lots of Yerby's work, Yerby's work is just that, historical fiction. And so our bookshelves at home were full of Yerby's work. So at about 11 or 12, I started reading Yerby because mm -hmm. of her, and I kept reading it. And actually I got the good fortune of my freshman composition teacher in college being Jerry Ward, who's um, a very prominent um, African-American literary critic and in African-American literature. And so I just said, I need to know about, more about this Frank Yerby. Why is it that as important as as many books as he's written mm -hmm. and first that, you know, I kind of have found out that he's done, why haven't we heard about him when we're studying Black history, right? Um, so um, I started doing research there in um, my honors lit class with Jerry Ward as a freshman and kept doing it throughout graduate school. That's a pretty amazing story. <laughs> <laughs> the power of undergrad research. <laughs> yes, yes. Librarian in me loves that, you know. Yes. Uh, Dr. Tetchak, can you tell us how you came up on Yerby? 
Yeah, I, there's two things I want to say real quick. One is we we're here because of people like Jerry Ward and Mary Emma Graham and Darwin Turner and everybody who did work on Yerby before we got here, of course. Um, and one thing that Veronica said that I think I think it was a slip up and she corrected herself. But then I was like, it's true. She called Yerby an esteemed scholar. Oh, and, yes. And when she said that, I was like, he is because he one is. thing that um, Dr. Matthews pointed out, or that we may point out later, is how much use of historical research information is using. But that's that's for another question. But my introduction to Yerby was a little bit different. Going to the used book sales when I was a PhD student at the University of Louisiana Lafayette, going over to the first edition table and finding first edition. I found a first edition like Fox is a Hero the first time I was there with the cover falling off. I think I heard the name Yerby before. Um, I'm not sure, but I picked it up, bought it. I mean, it was like two bucks, three bucks. Found a couple of other Yerby novels. Don't remember, maybe The Golden Hawk and some other stuff. And just put them on my shelf. Never thought I would read it. Never thought I would do anything with it. I came to New Orleans, where I actually am right now, and went to, I think, Beckham's um, Octavia. I went to a bookstore here and found Speak Now, which was his 23rd novel his first novel with the black protagonist. Um, and the cover really caught my attention because it was unlike it was unlike any of the other covers or books that I had on my shelf. So I read it and immediately was like, oh, he's doing a lot of stuff. So then I went back and read The Fox is a Hero. And as Veronica noted, noticing the things that he's doing there um, that are really, you, I think you have to pay attention to them, which we'll talk about in a second too, but yeah yeah and, and then seeing what he's doing with those costume novels that's how i kind of got started that's, that's great the and this is you know any of you are welcome to jump in how would you explain yerby um becoming a lost voice or as we we saw on the slide you know a man in the shadows um and why should he be revived you know there are a lot of authors that we probably you know kind of get lost to history so you know uh, why do you think he was lost and then why do we need to bring him back and revive your yeah you mind if i jump in there okay yeah i i really think that he was lost because um the politics of our um publishing system and the politics of our academy which are the two places where we keep writers alive. That's how mm -hmm. they get passed from generation to generation. Both were working against the kind of writing that he was doing. But so on the, the scholarly side, uh, in terms of what we do as teachers and uh, with students, we keep a writer alive by teaching his work in our classrooms. And Yerby was not someone who was being taught because he was seen as a popular writer. Um, and his politics were in the wrong place. And that's the other thing. So he was getting published, but he was seen as a, a writer who wasn't very serious uh, and certainly who wasn't engaging the political work of literature at the time and writing protest novels. Now, as I said, when he was doing the short stories, you see it all over the place. And we know that his first novel that he apparently destroyed uh, was uh, what we might recognize as a protest novel but the ones that he ended up publishing didn't appear to be so. I, I think we even misread that, but um, they didn't appear to be so. So it meant that um, the folks who had the power to kind of pick him up and celebrate him and talk about him uh, were disinclined to do so because he didn't look like what everybody else was doing. So that's my take on it. What do you two think? I think just to add a little bit to what you said, in addition to that, um, when you have these ideas like the, uh, the political unconscious, right, where you can read things and, and find politics in them, even when writers say they aren't there, in addition to people feeling like, well, on the surface, they're not there, he's also saying, you know, his personal philosophies turned people off. So it wasn't just the writing. So at the height, you know, of the Black aesthetic period, mm -hmm. we you know, if we're supposed to be, if the aesthetic for black, black writing should be that it is socially conscious, right? Mm -hmm. And even starting to have that debate and those conversations, even during the Harlem Renaissance before Yerby, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then you have him writing something, even with the Foxes of Harrow, where you could celebrate 
that black subplot and everybody would be able to see that and understand it. But then you have him saying, you know, no, I don't want to be thought of as a black writer. Yeah. Um, should not, my, my output should not be um, limited by a biological accident. Mm -hmm. And so um, people just allowed those, their own ideas about what he should be saying. Right. Um, also influence what they were thinking about his work um, and not um, going ahead and engaging what they see he's doing, mm -hmm. what he may be saying. And, yeah. and how he should be saying them. Because right. I think he's saying them, but it's how, right? I mean, you, you bring up the Harlem Renaissance and we're just coming off of Richard Wright's Native Son, which is 1940, and Petrie's The Street, which you said is 1940 or 41, right? And those are very social protest. Yeah. And we see him engaged with the social protest and political. And then when he fails to get that first novel published, I mean, Health Card is a social protest story. And that's 1904. Absolutely. That yeah. won the O. Henry Award, right? Yes, we and did. when he fails to get that first novel published, but he publishes Foxes, he's writing to a mass audience, but he has people like Langston Hughes and Arnold Montan praising him. Yeah. Saying that you've done away with having to focus on race, right? But then they push back as he moves forward and saying, well, you've done this. Why don't you come back to the to the to the race problem? Right. Mm -hmm. And then you bring up to the, the black arts movement, how that kind of works in there, because that's when you see speak now in 69. And that's when you see the Dahomean. Yeah, exactly. Like his his novel set in Africa, right, dealing with with African. Um, I, for, I forgot what tribe. Um, the Dahomean tribe. Yeah, sorry. Thank you. Mm -hmm dealing with the Homian tribe, right? And during the 17 and 1800s. So you see him engaging with, and you see him in interviews, even being like, you know, I pay attention to what's going on back home. Yeah. And yeah. I really think he's dealing with these issues and dealing with them under the surface. One example I always go to is Goat Song, which has its issues. It's definitely homophobic, I think, issues and misogynistic issues as he does throughout a lot of stuff. But that's published in 67, and he's dealing with interracial intimacy in that, in that novel set in ancient Greece. Yeah. That's, that's the 10 years now later. also like that. Yeah. Speak what? Now, speak Now is also right. Right. You know, kind of in that same vein. One of the things Griffin's that Way has that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, you know, I, I've been thinking about the work that um, Frank was producing as being the other side of the coin, right? And so what made it easy to dismiss was also what made it subversive. Mm -hmm. And so if he's reaching a primarily white audience who's thinking they're coming to it, um, you know, this sort of rollicking, fun read, like I came to it, right? Um, and then they get in there and as he says, you know, I have a strong defense of Black history in every novel that I publish. And I'm reaching the hard-hearted bigots in ways that, you know, a Baldwin or a Wright can't reach those folks. He really saw himself as doing the same kind of work. He was just doing it with the audience that needed to be engaged um, and doing it in a way that didn't turn them off and make them put the book down before they even had a chance to think about what was being said. So it was there. Um, and, and maybe he was hoping that there was enough of it kind of right there under the surface that they would come away and be changed, be touched, be, you know, expanded and thinking about things in a different way because they had read um, his novels, whereas they wouldn't ever pick up something like Native Son or, you know, Go Tell It on the Mountain. They, they wouldn't have, have done that. So he really saw himself as doing political work and doing work that helped to advance um, the, the social causes and uh, for equity and fairness. I mean, what he's, what he's doing, we can go on and on. I mean, just look at the first two pages of Fox is a Hero, where Aunt Colleen's the focus of that. Yeah. And Stephen and nobody else has mentioned the white protagonist of that novel. It's a dilapidated plantation hero, and you're seeing it in the current moment. And the only ghost or the only spirit that's around is Aunt Colleen, the enslaved woman who builds up hero, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, Yerby, Yerby for me, taught, taught me history. He, he's rebuffing the Dunning School. He's using Du Bois's Black Reconstruction throughout. I didn't, I grew up in North Louisiana. I didn't know about the Mechanics Institute. I didn't know about Kofax. I didn't know about the Bossier Massacre, which is where I grew up, until I read The Vixens. And they're really, they're really small mentions, specifically the Bossier Massacre in there, but it led me to go do more research about the 128 
or maybe 160 I've gotten mixed numbers, you know, black men, women, and children who were murdered in 1868 up there. Mm -hmm. So he's doing that type of work. And I'm really curious, Donna Lynn Washington deals with it in her essay in, in the um, collection Rediscovering Frank, Ger Frank Gerby. I'm interested in his readers yeah. and how they responded. Cause he says, I got this, some of them, but some of them I didn't, right? Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. All right, but absolutely. When we think about um, the uses of history and fiction and how even, you know, early on we talk about critics who say how, fiction really does much more cultural work mm -hmm. in people's minds. Um, and of course, then that would extend to, to movies and, and music, you know, currently. Um, he was really engaging that in a way that even predates scholars who did some of that same work. Mm -hmm. so in my research on Foxes of Harrow, I realized that his work on the WPA when he was there, like he spent some time at Southern University in Louisiana, right? He's doing all this work, collecting all this data and all of it finds its place to Foxes of Harrow before John Blassingame can even write Black New Orleans, right? So just the wealth of history and the way it is so easy to read and so palatable and so easy to remember. Yeah. Um, would get me jumping forward, but that's one of the reasons his work remains so relevant. Mm -hmm. um, it can still hold up after all these years. In some yeah. books, he gives you footnotes. That's right. Absolutely. I was just about to say and that. And notes to the reader at the beginning. Yeah, right. I was just about to say that. You know, when you're in the archives, it's amazing how much is still there. Notebooks with all of, I mean, like, you know, really fat notebooks, and there'll be two or three of them. And I'm looking at them, and I'm going, I think this is one novel that he was researching and it was like, you know, the notes that he was taking and the research he was doing on this one thing. And then you'll see like little collections of papers. So he was a meticulous historian, right? And so okay. Matthew, I appreciate your generosity there in saying that like I made a, a little slip that was actually kind of fortuitous. Yeah, I do think of him as a scholar because, yes, you know, I think his calling was sort of to rewrite uh, the bad history, you know, to rewrite the historical record and to bring voices in that had been excluded and omitted. And so I think he was, he was really purposefully doing that and he was doing it consciously, deliberately and with a lot of class and poise as he uh, did the research and brought it in. And I always focus on his costume novels, but the other things that he's doing, like I said, he's really pulling from Du Bois. I would say from Black Reconstruction. He's pulling from Herskovitz, as he says, for the Dahomean, right? Mm -hmm. um, but one of the other things I think that he's really doing, and I just thought about this, because I've thought about this theme, but I haven't thought about it in this way with, with getting to his readers, is the ways that he's pointing out the, the class structures and the social structures related to class and race and how the wealthy so division between the poor whites and blacks, right? Yeah. That's in Griffin's way, that's in all of his work. And that's something Du Bois talks about, Lillian Smith talks about on and on and on. And I really think, and I'm, I'm really curious about what kind of impact that may have had on his readers because that's what you get with Fred Hampton and the Black Panthers. Mm -hmm. it, you, you get that thread still going through, he's just doing it in a different way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I have a note about that. And especially as we talk about, I think Yerby, especially, the way that he talks about race and class um, really fits into our rethinking about caste in the United States mm -hmm. and everybody understanding that we really function under a caste system and that we have. And so it just, and it works so well with this new work like that Isabel Wilkerson has done. Mm -hmm. um, and I just see, you know, Yerby's ideas working through caste in every society that he writes about. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. Whether it's Moorish Spain, whether it's those years of research he did on Jesus and Jesus's family, mm -hmm. Judas, my brother, and to even try to rework the Jesus story, yeah. right? I still um, need to read that book. Remarkable. Yeah. Pardon me? I still need to read that. I always kind of start it, but then I'm like, uh, it's just a lot. It's just so thick. <laughs> It's, it's the, but again, the fact that they're page turners and that you can almost do it as, you know, Veronica was talking about that it, it's not laborious. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I mean, can do so much work and be leisurely. Yeah, they're long, but you're talking about that. encourage my students not to be discouraged. <laughs> I think 
think about, um, I mean, shifting it a little bit, I, I need to reread Tobias and the Angel, but when I read that, I thought of Percival Everett. Mm. Or Ishmael Reed, right? This this kind of postmodernist discussion. He's chameleon may not be the right word, but he, he shows you his artistic kind of range. Yeah. Um I think that's absolutely right, Matthew. And I would say that um the short stories also demonstrate that. There is a, a wonderful line uh at the one of the letters of the archive where, and I think he's absolutely right. He said, I can make a phone book interesting. And <laughs> right. That's right. I, yeah. I, think, I think it's absolutely right. But the ranginess of those short stories, I think, is absolutely reflected in at least the subject matter of his novels, if not the approaches that he's using. But even, you know, by the time he's in the middle of his career and later, even that's changing. He's not just strictly writing historical romances anymore, which is sort of what I imagine, you know, the first half of his career had done. And so, you know, we have ghost stories in there. We have, you know, meditations on the meaning of life and death and a, what a good life is. We have uh, supernatural stories. We uh, have angels. Uh, historical yeah. things, you know, so there's there's something that's very much sort of a, a social realism uh, piece. And in fact, there are two of those in there. Um, and so he really um, could take just about anything. And I think he was a very kind of a wide ranging, almost rapacious intellect, right? He found mm -hmm. interest in lots and lots of different things. And when something caught his attention, he would follow it down the rabbit hole, you know? And, and I, I, there were moments where I wish that I could have that conversation with him. How on earth did you come up with this as a story idea? <laughs> of him, James Baldwin and Lillian Smith or somebody in the room or on a bomb right. Could you all talk a little bit about him as a person, maybe? Because it's so interesting, the, the conversation y'all are having about, you know, he started off with this novel that couldn't get done. So he, you know, put that aside, then did, you know, super popular historic fiction, but he's, he's very confident and I can make a phone book interesting. So he seems like a, like a, like a really, really confident, you know, person, you know, how did he interact with others or with the public or with um, other writers of the time? Um, can y'all talk about that a little bit? Would that be Veronica? I have no clue. Oh, yeah, yeah, well, okay. So uh, this is the part that I get really excited about. because I feel like I got to know him when I was working on him over, you know, a, a period of about six or seven years, actually. Um, and there, I interviewed folks uh, in his hometown of Augusta who still remember him. I mean, you know, um, and he has a, a large shadow there in that community. So people keep his memory alive. Um, and what I'm hearing or had, what I did hear from folks was that uh, at least younger, um, when he was younger, he was sort of a loner. Um, someone talked about him as having an impatient intellect. And so, you know, he would, he would kind of lose interest if you couldn't keep up with him. Um, one, the son of one of his teachers says that his mother always said that he, she was the smartest kid that she had ever taught in her 40 years of teaching. <laughs> Wow, I'd love for somebody to say that about me, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I, I think um, that he, he was uh, both just really super smart, but also kind of irascible. Um, he was a bit of a loner. Um, he kind of charted his own way and did his own thing, fiercely independent. Uh, but his family members um, also say that later in life, uh, he could be fairly gregarious and kind of outgoing. And so, uh, yeah, people are just one thing. I think that's what we, we have to kind of understand. And for him, um, I think what, we, what we're seeing in his writing is probably evidence of what kind of a person he was, you know? So really mm -hmm. super smart. I could imagine there being a great conversation, but if you couldn't keep up, <laughs> I can right. see how he would be like, okay, well, let's move on. You know, I might as well go back to my room and do my thing because this just kind of got boring to me, you know? Um, so yeah, that's what I'm kind of imagining anyway. And I think, and, and some of you, um, Veronica, you might be sharper definitely on this story than I am, but um, as I read um, some of his work um, and was trying to explore his idea of this guilt of the victim. So mm -hmm. this also goes back to one of the reasons he would have become a lost voice. Mm -hmm. Um, and that this, this early childhood 
well, early trauma that he experienced, you know, when he's walking with his sister in public and she's light enough to pass apparently. And so he gets, um, he gets beaten up because um, they think that there's this black man or boy walking around, along with this white girl. Mm-hmm. And so that trauma, that early trauma seemed to really have affected him and his output. And I think that we can kind of locate his first kind of rumblings with the guilt of the victim, even kind of looking at himself and thinking about how he experienced that and then his later exp- expatriation. But the way he talks about wanting to explore and has, you know, the voice of Harry saying, speak now. No, I'm not pl- proud to be Black. Mm-hmm. Goes through all of these explanations about the things that Black folks have allowed to happen to them as victims. Um, and so that makes him very controversial. Yeah, It's I very think- controversial. Um, but he does continue to push that and develop it. And like you say, he's not one thing. Mm-hmm. And a thinker. And he allows himself to grow and change. And I think we even see, as you read through the books, you know, as early as Foxes of Harrow, you see uh, La Belle Sauvage, um, the um, enslaved woman who is right off the boat um, from Africa, you know, killing herself. Mm -hmm. She's like, I refuse. I do not. And she tries to kill her child, too, which is why Tante Colleen ends up rearing Inch, her grandson and wanting to make sure that she finds a way for him in this new world. Um, But it's almost like she's his first expression of that. Like he wants to say, this is what, and he writes and talks about that sometimes about, this is what people should have done to resist. But again, he also gives us those images of, well, but then this is what Tante Colleen did to resist and survive and thrive and continue to live. So you kind of see that tension, but um, that definitely is um, one of those early stories that you do hear about Frank Kirby, about that incident really, really affecting him and being an early trauma experienced, you know, in Georgia, you know, in his life. There's a, there's a couple of things. You touched on something there, Valerie, that I think runs through a lot of, a lot of his work, which I'm gonna to get to in a second, but is, is that, that threat of identity Mm-hmm. And coming to terms, I think, with himself as an author, I always go back to the to the James Hill um, interview where he talks about, um, you know, not wanting. He's talking he's talking about a lot of things, but one of the things that sticks out to me is he, he's asking what makes a black author. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I think that gets into that kind of that thread of identity, but also that thread of you know his reception because he says, you know, is Alex is Alexander Dumas a black author because he had African heritage, right? He's like. No, is Guy de Maupassant a Black author because he writes about Black people? And he would say, yeah, right? And probably his favorite, my favorite quote from him, or one of them is, is from that interview, and I'm paraphrasing it, where he says, um, I despise adjectives, adjectives which are the enemies of nouns, right? Yeah. <laughs> so he, he's really getting into kind of this, I, I see the treasure of Pleasant Valley as kind of his struggle with, you know, his, his identity that's when he expatriates mm-hmm. um, to France. I think that's when he expatriates to France, not to Spain, because he moves to France in 51, if I remember correctly. But I see that thread running throughout and that comment you had from, from Harry from Speak Now, but I wanted to go to this real quick because Catherine Adams, who taught at Payne, I think she's at Claflin now, has a really good essay in here about teaching Frank Yerby at Payne and bringing him back there. And she actually interviews a classmate who went to Payne with him in, in 1939. She graduated, um, Ruth B. Crawford, she interviewed her, or her students interviewed her in 2014, and Crawford graduated in 1939 from Payne. And this is one thing she says, and th- this is partly um, Catherine's words and Ruth's words, but Crawford recalled, Frank Yerby was a brilliant scholar, very brilliant, but his social skills were, p- were poor. And this is when he's in college. Um, Crawford remembered he was a straight A student. She also, she also shared a specific moment in an English class with Yerby, and this is Crawford quoting. Now, I was in his class when he wrote the first poem for Harper's Magazine. They had never published anything by Blacks before. You have to look at that day and time I was in school. And Miss Emma C.W. Gray had him to read the poem to us. And she said, so this is Gray, young man, you're going to be a great writer if you apply yourself and do something for your temper. Hmm. Um, the other thing I think to, to point out too is, and I know other people know this a lot more than I do, is you know 
the culture he grew up with in, you know, going to paint, going to Lucy, uh, was it Lucy Terry, um, to the Haynes Institute, right? Mm -hmm. um, in Augusta. I mean, that whole kind of, I think, community formulating them too. Yeah. And I was going to mention uh, that I think that Yerby was actually uh, really angry and impatient with racism. Right. I mean, you can be lots of things when confronted with that reality. But I, I think that he just could not stomach the idea. And one of the um, interviews, one of the few interviews outside of the Hill piece, for instance, I think he got interviewed twice by Hill, but one magazine uh, was able to interview him. I think it was that Ebony. That Fuller one? It, it might have been. I, I was going to. I was going to mention that one when you talked about Madrid, because it really talks about his lifestyle in that one. Right. And you can find them on yeah. Google for free. Exactly. And I think in that piece, he said uh, something along the lines of um, any Black man who has money and chooses to stay in the U.S. is crazy, <laughs> right? I mean, he just, he, he would not, could not um, have imagined a life in this country uh, given the inequity and the danger and the violence that existed here. If he had an alternative or an option, he was going to take it. And, um, you know, and I think in the same way that we were talking earlier about him having this real mixed emotion around uh, enslaved people who did not fight or die, right? You got two options. You're either going to fight until you're free or you're going to die trying. He, he didn't understand how you would enslave a whole race of people. And I think that that's sort of the same thing that motivates him to leave this country. It's mm -hmm. like, either I'm gonna stay here and I'm going to die a slow and painful death, emotionally, psychologically, mm -hmm. because it's everything is stacked up against me, or I'm gonna get out of here because I can't, I can't survive it here. You know, so I think um, we see that thread also kind of weaving its way through the literature as well as his life. It's it's sort of the same impetus, if you will. Right. No, oh, I just want to say something else I found interesting about his actual life is that, you know, with his being a Payne graduate, so for those of you who are not familiar with it, it's a historically Black college, okay, in Augusta, Georgia. And so I was interested as I, you know, did some research and was seeing that he spent some time teaching and then he went to Fisk as well. And he spent some time teaching at Southern and maybe somewhere else. But he was also very frustrated with HBCUs and thinking that historically Black colleges were not doing enough to radicalize their students. Mm. I think, you know, he had a lot of frustration with that too. And yeah. all of that kind of speaks to how complex he really was. Yeah. Person, this was not somebody who was just, you know, very... You know, like, I want to just, I want to write about white characters. I want to identify with white life, which is how a lot of people have very oversimplified him as a person. The fact that he's, you know, taking on um, things that have predominantly white characters often. He's yeah. very frustrated, um, as we all have said, with how things are going in the U.S. and um, ways that African-Americans can have, carve out a different space for themselves. I'm just, I, I see we have three questions, Eli, sorry. Um, I just wanted to add one thing to what you said, Valerie, and what you said, Veronica, because you mentioned he taught at Southern. And one thing out of the blue, like a year ago, when I sent these to Veronica, um, a guy, in, he was either in Lafayette or New Orleans, sent us those two letters, right? One from Flora and one from, from Frank about World War II and him entering the draft. And he talks about working at Southern, but he also talks about the frustrations of the United States not doing what it needs to do for issues here yeah, and going to, to fight in Europe, right? I mean, like I said, others as well. I mean, that's a double B campaign. Lillian and Smith had the same thing. Another Georgia author, white Georgia author in that case, she had, she had the same comments, right? And he's very, very much engaged and very frustrated yeah. within his letter. Um, I didn't get a chance to read it before this, but yeah. So you see it. Right. The um you mentioned his you know, service in World War II and the well, he Black we know he went to did not get uh, yeah, he didn't serve. Yeah. yeah. He, he, did, the, he did work at the at the airplane factory in New York, right? That's a whole other story that I've heard about that his family 
the people thought he was, correct me if I'm wrong, the community thought he was white, but then they found out he was black and wanted him out. Yeah. Did his, do you think, uh, you know, you all mentioned him visiting or going to France and then Spain. Uh, was part of that the, the veterans that did come back telling him about Europe and how, you know, maybe how more accepting Europe was and that's why he went over there. Can y'all talk a little bit about what led him to go to Spain? In your, yeah, I, think so. I think it was an escape valve. I mean, like if ever I mean, there was a North Star kind of moment, right? It's like anywhere but here. I I kind of feel. Right. Um, yeah, I hadn't heard anything or seen anything that suggests that you know he was being motivated by anything other than I have to leave here, and I think it's better there. And but you he, know, there's a big tradition of expatriate writers, yeah, yes. expatriates going to France. Yeah particular and then other places in Europe. So you've got Chester Himes, who has expatriated, who does similar kind of work as the Arab writers there. James you've got Baldwin James Baldwin there. very famously <laughs> doing this. You know, so you've got lots of writers and musicians and 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 yeah. so I think that probably would have been a little more well and in the thing too the story you haven't mentioned yet, which is on your slide, he knew about the issues he would even face in Europe too from salute to the flag. What year yeah. was that published? Because that was published while he was at Payne. What year was that, Veronica? Was that 38? Mm, yeah, don't make me lie to you. But but it was it was during Payne while he was while he was at school at Payne. He published yeah. it in the Payne, the Paynette. And that's a dramatic monologue about a, an African-American soldier bleeding out in the back of a car coming back from World War I. And when the flag goes by during a parade, he thumbs his nose at it, basically, he basically kneels at it, you know, like like Kaepernick or, or flips it off. Yeah. And he says, because I was over there, I experienced freedom. And, you know, um, his friend is walking with a, with a white French woman. And then there's a group of guys from Georgia who attack him and kill him, basically, right? And he, and he dies at the end. Yeah. So it's, it's very much a social protest, but, but he knows that those issues are going to follow him. That's what Speak Now deals with, is those issues following even yeah. when he moves, or even when somebody moves. You know, and I think it's worth remembering that when Frank goes to Spain, uh, by the time he moves there, that's Franco Spain. I mean, people are being killed for writing. <laughs> They're being, you know, it's it's not as if it's, uh, you know, this sort of idyllic. Uh, but he he made a good life there, and it, at least the understanding of the scholars who are in Madrid who have been studying him is that he found a niche that worked for him. But the biggest thing was he would not have faced racism, color racism in the same way. So if he had he money looked Spanish in the right. circles, he would have been fine, you know? And so he would not have confronted some of the things that he found so completely odious here that I think motivated him leaving. We'll talk a little bit about some of his uh, literary his literary circle, like some of his friends and contacts and who he interacted with, if many at all, or if he stayed aside from kind of the circles of, uh, you know, African-American, you know, literati, you know, yeah. why? Why do you think maybe he did that and didn't take part in that? Even the ones that, well, I don't know. I mean, even with both complex sides of his nature, you know, they could have fit in multiple circles. I want to know more about Chicago. Gerdix talks about that some with Dorothy West, but do you know more about that, Veronica or Valerie, with who he interacted with in Chicago? Well, I know during his time when the WPA projects, um, whether in Chicago or in Louisiana, he, or, you know, like Margaret Walker and some of the other writers, mm -hmm. for WPA, he was thrown in with them. But I don't know how much he really interacted with them in terms of discussing work and. And you know how they would do their work or any of that. I, I don't know, but I know he would have. He was interacting and working with other writers during his time with, on the uh, WPA. What was he writing during the WPA? Can you talk about that just briefly? His um, what what he was doing for the WPA? I think they were collecting oh, yeah narratives like early um, yeah. narratives of enslaved people who still survived and mm -hmm. stories. Um, about Black life. And so this was part of, um, you know, kind of the social safety net program and the part that the writers could work on. And um, so I think that they were collecting like oral narratives, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which were related to African-American life. 
Yeah, I think so. And what I can tell you is that when he was overseas, um, it appears that he uh, sort of met for drinks, if you will, uh, with a couple of writers that were there, including Richard Wright, but uh, he didn't seem to have pursued any uh, lengthy or deep connections with writers who were either in France or England, and he traveled all over Europe, and so, you know, he could have been anywhere to see anyone at any time, and he does not seem to have uh, cultivated those kinds of relationships with writers. Not I, there anyway. I just wanted to read this real quick, too. This is from Gerdex Massey's um, essay. He teaches at Augusta State, but and I was just looking back through this, but he talks about his connection with Dorothy West and getting her to, or talking with her to get published. And this stuck out to me, must have been through here, in a letter dated June 1st, 1934, a 17-year-old Frank Yerby. He knew what he wanted to do yeah. for a while. A 17-year-old Frank Yerby expressed to Dorothy West, the Harlem Renaissance writer and founder of the New York-based Ch uh, magazine Challenge, this is Yerby now, the idea of a Renaissance in Negro letters appe appeal appeals to me very strongly. I hope to be in the vanguard of those who will foster such a rebirth. If your magazine is successful, which I believe it will be, it will be the very hub of such a movement. Nice. So he understood himself within this tradition mm -hmm. and within this moment too, coming out of the Harlem Renaissance and then Bronzeville. And then when you were talking, Valerie, I keep thinking there's hardly any mention of him in, in Robert Bones, um, the, Bron the Bronzeville book, I don't remember what it is. There's hardly any mention of him in Fabre's um, Black Writing in Paris. I forgot the name of it. But, but his book about expatriate authors, th there's there's hardly, there's just these, these passing right. mentions of Yerby mm -hmm. within these kind of broader context. And maybe that's partly because he didn't interact or move in those circles, like you said, Veronica, mm -hmm. as much as other authors did. I don't you know. You know that Langston Hughes reached out to him to ask him for copies of his books. Yeah, uh, Donna, to um, Different African countries as part of the work that he was doing. So like they knew him, they knew of him, they knew right. where he was, they and knew Hughes how he was. Hughes him. Yeah. And um, somebody pointed me to, to one of the simple stories, which deals with Yerby and the Vixens in the role of the author, right? And I forgot the name of it. Um, if you remember, do y'all remember? Mm -mm. I'm, not, I'm not aware hold up, of that. Hold up. It's, it's in the introduction here. Hold up. I got it. Matthew always knows so much detail about these things. Like, oh, wow. Well, well, <laughs> y'all know, know more than me. Y'all know that more than I do, too. Um, it's matter for a book and simple speaks his mind. Oh, okay. But then, but then also Hughes and the best short stories of black writers published his health card mm -hmm. because it wins the O. Henry prize. But then mm -hmm. in, the, in the introduction later, he's like, well, Yerby turned to basically these costume novels and romances and did it for the money. Yeah. So there's all this, there's always this kind of, you know, doing it for the money <laughs> that followed him. And like Veronica said, can you really fault him for doing that? Yeah. With uh, with his um, foxes of horror, did was is the book and the movie pretty close, or did how did, the, <laughs> how did Hollywood oh, no. <laughs> did Hollywood, Hollywood does what Hollywood yeah. does, right? <laughs> Don't watch the movie. Yeah, this is definitely well, one where you have to read the book, or you yeah. won't understand anything we're saying about so, the importance of the black subplot. Yeah. So, so if, if you if you want to do this, I don't remember the hashtag we used, but I think I think Veronica may have done it with this, and Donna Lynn Washington did it. But we did we did a Twitter thread where we watched it, <laughs> and I've watched it a few times because my essay in the book deals with the movie adaptation. And you're like, why did I saddle myself with this? <laughs> no, it's, it's horrendous. Um, it, it, you can watch it on YouTube if you want, but but I, I would say read the book because, it, from the outset, it does not start off you know, the same way. Yeah. And, and, and his book lays out with two, within two pages, I think his whole kind of debunker of myths as, as Darwin Turner calls them. Those first two pages lay out his whole 33 books <laughs> that come after, right? I wonder if that was some of the, you know, any of the friction between him and the other African-American authors you all were talking about that some may have thought he sold out. You know, if, you know, you're, it seems like a big momentous thing, the first African-American author whose book is optioned, but it wasn't optioned as an African-American story. It was optioned and then, you know, yeah. I, think got, the movie. I think it got whittled down from what I understand. Do y'all know anything about how much it got whittled down? Because I saw know, something there, where there was a great out. essay out there about that, actually. Someone has actually. And I used that, that one. That's the, um, 
I forgot her name. It's in CLA. Yeah, yeah. Um, I use that. But yeah, how much? Did, I how actually much think you're really. He, oh, I'm sorry. How much did he make? Was it two hundred twenty-five thousand? Two hundred fifty thousand. Yeah, <laughs> quite a bit of money. But Eli, I think you're on to something. I mean, um, you know, if we're thinking about the 1940s, um, to to have someone uh, walking away with 250k, that's a lot of money now, right? To have someone walking away with 250k uh, for a novel, and then that novel to have gotten celebrated the way that it did. Um, and you're talking about a time where people are still very sensitive to pecuniary kinds of uh, pursuits, right? You do this for love, passion, calling. You don't do this because you're trying to make money. If you try to make money, that puts you out of the pale of a serious writer. And so contextually, historically, I think that also uh, serves to maybe offer some explanation for why he got sidelined the way that he did, because he was very open about um, you know, his desire to earn a living from his writing. Um, and that he was making the choices that he was so that he could have a large readership and sell a lot of books. And I think that that was something, especially during that time, that would not have been respected. Whereas now we look at a best-selling author and it was like, well, everybody's piling on the bandwagon. A best-selling author during that period may have been received with a little more suspicion and kind of sideways glancing. And I think that's something that, you know, is why it's easier to have an entree to studying him today because we do study about popular fiction and how popular fiction works in society and how popular culture, right? We study popular culture in the academy and that's not something, you know, folks were doing back then. Um, talking about um, how it can still transform culture and all those things. Um, so that gives us another, you know, entree to thinking about him in 2022 is, is looking at these critics who, who are looking at even at romance fiction and formulaic fiction and how it functions and how we can study works like that. So that kind of lands in the academy and even for popular writers and readers, right? The readers, as Veronica was saying, would respect that more now, this fact that even then, he was able to make his living and a very, very good living. You know, I hear like maybe, you know, there's talk of, right, his purchasing <laughs> some, some space off the coast of Spain and, you know, in cars and all of those kinds of things. Yeah. Um, and so living an extravagant lifestyle, the kinds of things that, you know, our students can relate to from the most, you know, um, lavish rap songs, you know, enumerating yeah. all of your wealth and all these things that you've been able to do. Well, he did that yeah. in the 40s and 50s yeah. and 60s and said all the way through, you know, the 91 and yeah. 91 to when he died. Right. So, I mean, he is able to consistently do it, consistently publish. Um, and th that's another thing that he's so valuable because we have a writer that we can observe and see how he changes and grows over a whole lifetime. It's such a huge oeuvre of work. Right. Well, you, men you mentioned, and I was just going to wrap up, you mentioned the popular culture thing. He's also working within a long tradition, as Veronica points out, of the white estrangement literature with Chestnut and everybody. Absolutely. The, the popular culture thing really gets me too, because I, I just attended a panel today where somebody was talking about Percival Everett's erasure, and I was like, I need to reread that book because this is really going into what Yerby was dealing with, with the market, with the way that book publishing works and what we read, what we deem as credible, specifically credible within African-American literature, what is mm -hmm. on that, right? Yeah. And my project on Black Panther, I think about that too, because Christopher Priest was the first Black author to write Black Panther. There was a Black artist in the 70s or, or a few Black artists until then, but that's like 30 something years after Black Panther, the comic book character appears, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And his kind of framing, he's a black author and he says, I didn't want the book to be about race. I didn't want to do this. He has kind of all these same kind of comments that Yerby has. And what's really fascinating about his kind of, his run on Black Panther is he centers it, the first few issues through a, through a white narrator. Mm -hmm. And he basically says, because most of the readers are comics, which this is really kind of a fallacy, most of the readers are comics are white. It's Yerby. 
And yeah. he's still, even though he's saying he's not dealing with race, is being subversive in the same way Yerby's doing. Yeah. So Yerby's really helped me to kind of think about kind of these things within popular culture too. Um, and one thing we haven't mentioned too, the people who Yerby inspired, George R. R. Martin talks about Yerby, you know, him reading Yerby. One thing that I found, um, Thomas Mullen, who I'm not sure if he's been on the panel of Lost Southern Voices, but whose book Dark Town deals with the first um, African-American police officers in Atlanta. He was on Twitter and Stephen King tweeted, you know, is Uncle Percy and Thomas Mullen's Dark Town based off of the author Frank Yerby? And Mullen responded, yes, he is, right? So Uncle Percy in Dark Town, he appears in like two chapters, this kind of um, flamboyant cosmopolitan guy who comes back to Atlanta, right? You can really see Yerby in him. Mm -hmm. But the fact that Stephen King notes that, if you so all were showing you his, his influence, right? If you all were able to make a recommendation for uh, the general reader, you know, to have a entry point into Yerby, um, what would you think that best first book, first one to experience of Yerby would be? I'm voting foxes. <laughs> <laughs> I can't help it. It's still my favorite. Um, and I think that. It, it's such um, it's such an illustration of his skill, uh, of the themes that he's going to carry through over half of his career, of the complexity of black characters that he creates, uh, and the complexity of white characters that he creates. Um, so that would be my vote, even though it's it's a little bit longer, but you know not unreasonably so. But it's such a good read. It's such a good read. So that's my vote. Well, I'd like to say, because I wanted to mention this as well, because I don't want us to forget that he also wrote a neo-slave narrative, which, I mean, my whole dissertation is about trying to really center him in the African-American tradition of writing, mm -hmm. um, because he should not be as marginal as he is. And as you see, every thread of African-American literature that's canonized, there's a place for your be there. Mm -hmm. So but I would say, start with the Dahomean, which is the um, centered in... Africa during the 19th century. That's the first part of the story of, of Wesur. Um, and then later on, there's the, a darkness at Ingram's Crest <laughs> and follows his story. You can see the rest of it there. But that doesn't focus on him though, does it? From what I remember. It's no, it does. It doesn't. It does. I, I need to reread it. It's um, there's a lot of focus on Wesu and like this um, you know, there's the bad black man characterization, and um, he really carries that through um, in a darkness of at Ingram's crest as the continuation of Nyasan or Wesus or West by the time he gets to the U.S. Right, um, and so you even see at the beginning of Dahomean, it mm -hmm. it shows at the very beginning of the Dahomean, you see where he's going to end up being West in the U.S. That he's going to end up being enslaved right in the United States. But then, so you get to harken back and think about, okay, it makes people think about what were enslaved people really living like? Because Yerby wanted to debunk these myths about, okay, yes, there's some really awful myths about there not being any civilization and all that. But at the same time, he was like, wasn't a king or a queen either, right? Yeah. But all of us are not descended from an actual king and queen. There were actual king and queens, but there were governors and there were chiefs and there were other very complex levels of government. So especially since I'm teaching Africana studies right now, I would suggest that as a good place to start, the Dahomean. Okay. I was the Dahomean say is the neo-slave narrative, correct? No, well, the second part of it would be the neo-slave okay. narrative. Well, English class. But the Dahomean is just historical fiction set in 19th century. Um, the homie. The, I, I would say that a lot of his novels are, we could read them as neo-slave narratives. I would say not just the darkness, but the, the one thing that stuck up to me about the darkness of Ingraham's crest, and, and why I said that, because it's been, it's been a few years since I read it, that's why I asked. Um, and I see this with the Dahomey, and I see this with all of his work, because one of my entry points too was the ways that he counters those myths you talked about, Valerie, specifically of white Southern womanhood, because the, the women and the relationships in his novels that are sustainable, that are pure may not be the right word, but, but that would fit the ideal of white Southern womanhood 
are the relationships between the black men and black women, the enslaved mm -hmm. between the costume novels and the white women are all over the place, right? Mm -hmm. with, with, their, with their relationships. And I remember the, the scene in the Darkness of Ingraham's Crest where the woman's having sex with the judge or whatever and the storm and her baby's killed, but she finishes having, you know, that scene. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, mm -hmm. and that sticks out to me because she's so overcome with their passions. That's partly Yerby's misogyny, I think, too, and his audience he's writing to, but that's another issue um, for me. But, and that's really what I get from that. And I take away, too, you know, if, if somebody would start with things, I would say Veronica's book possibly so you can get kind of a context for what he's moving into with foxes um i started with speak now my favorite's the treasure of pleasant valley which is a western right mm -hmm. and it, it deals with a with a guy who is part of a carolina planner family he moves to the west he moves to california during the gold rush right that's probably one of my favorite quotes which says um blind patriotism this is a summary of blind patriotism stupid <laughs> i always go to that quote but I would say if you start with foxes, know what you're looking at before you get into it, because you could read it like Gone with the Wind. Yeah. But he's rebuking Gone with the Wind. Absolutely. And, oh, and he says so. He says, that's what I'm doing, yeah. that Margaret Mitchell did an awful job here, and I'm going to do this better. So as we sit here in Atlanta Metro, or as I do, <laughs> we have to make sure we talk about <laughs> in the scheme of things. Right. There was one more thing, too, I totally forgot. Good. Very good. I want to uh, thank everyone for um, presenting and coming today. This was so incredibly fascinating. Oh. So, oh, did you think of it? Go ahead. Yeah, I, mean, I looked at the chat. I just finished a woman called Fancy, and it took me a while to get through it. But it, his discussions of the convict lease system, I think, in there, in the end. But but the one thing that stuck, the one thing I remember too is you were talking, Valerie, too. I just finished Fair Oaks, and two other running themes that I think are really important with him is that he shows that whites did not come into this land and become masters of plantations. The Arsenault family and foxes, um, the, is it the fox, I think, in Fair Oaks? I mean, the fox are imposters in Fair Oaks. And then the Brantleys and a woman called Fancy all came from nothing when they immigrated, right? I think that's important. But the thing I thought about with Fair Oaks is when Guy Fawkes goes to, um, to Africa during the Middle Passage and he debunks basically the myths of the Middle Passage that the, that the captain says, he's like, this is vile and putrid. And you see the characters changing. You see Guy change. You see Stephen change in Foxes, yeah. right? Mm -hmm, absolutely. Perfect. Well, thank you so much. Um, this was this was a great conversation, um, and uh, we hope all of the attendees attend other of our Lost Southern Voices uh, panels. So, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Well, thank you all so much for attending our panel this afternoon. Once again, thank you to Eli, Matthew, Valerie, and Veronica for this enlightening conversation. Maybe for next year there can be a panel about Frank Yerby, maybe Margaret Walker. Oh yeah. Yes. Throw in, throw in, you know, yeah. Yes. Do a do a whole, you know, narrative of, of the plantation south and you know who did it best. Um, <laughs> but thank you all for joining us. We had attendees from eight states, including Georgia, also an attendee from London, England, and an attendee from Lake Lugano in Italy. So buonasera for joining us over in Europe. Thank you all so very much. Our winner for the raffle is Hugh Ruppersberg. So we will be contacting you next week at the conclusion of the festival so you can pick up those books that you've earned today. We will see you tomorrow at 1 p.m. Thank you all so very much, and we will see you again soon. <laughs>